Okay, perfect. Um, so this study was a study that uh, actually spanned two years. Um, we, we had a new program that we were starting up last year um, where we were trying to get first year students into the lab and to doing research. And so um, we were looking actually at uh, the <clears throat> impact properties of, uh, of 3D printed structures. So we were actually hitting these with, with an impactor. Um, but we were changing around the parameters for um, the testing itself. And so like how, how it was sliced, what the settings were for the fill, for the different layers and whatnot. Um, we, we ran into some problems early on with equipment availability. And so we switched over to something else, which was welding. And so we actually figured out that uh, we could weld these bars together and create these nice little tensile tests that we would break. Um, and so the first study was all about the efficacy of welding. Um, and so the second year was an adaptation of that to figure out how we would design a part in order to be purposefully welded together. And so some of the reasons behind this would include composite tooling. So one of the things that we teach here at Winona State University is how to design composite parts. And so this is fiberglass, carbon fiber, typically what, what everyone is familiar with. But if we're making um, a panel, a flat panel, we could just use something that's flat, a table. Typically, you use a glass sheet because um, it's nice and smooth and flat. Um, but if we need to have some slight curvature, we can actually create some type of wood form underneath and then clamp a sheet metal thin sheet metal to that, um, or create some type of deformation on that sheet itself, and then put our fabric on, infuse it with resin, and hold it in place while that resin cures. And then we have our composite panel. Um, even more complex is where we start getting into some very intricate tooling. In this case, this could be really, really uh, manufacturing heavy. So we'd, we'd have some people with some very, very unique skill sets that are expensive equipment that's expensive, materials that are expensive and time consuming to get to. And so you may be upwards of $10,000 for a tool and it may take three to four weeks to actually get it done. So for prototyping space, this can be a really, really expensive uh, proposition. Um, and so we, we have to do some, some optimization. So on the 3D printing side, this allows us to do a lot of prototyping, but we, we have a very small space usually to work with. Um, the nice thing about this though, is that you don't have to have skills uh, other than doing the CAD work itself and having a little bit of know-how on how to um, get your, your parts going. Um, the other thing too, is that we, we could get away with less than 30 minutes. Usually it's five minutes to get something like this going. Um, and then you can just walk away for 20 hours and come back and your part's done. Uh, so from a prototyping standpoint, this is wonderful. Um, the downside is that everything that's printed in 3D printing has this weak plane, which is um, in the stack direction, so in the Z height. Um, so if you don't design with that in mind, um, you could really make a part that's very weak and may not actually even survive taking off some of the prep work from from the part itself. So if you had any type of support that you were printing on, it, it could just break. Um, so uh, if you can design around that, then we could actually have some really detailed molds or tools that are created. Um, and it doesn't have to have any like techno technical skills behind it necessarily. Um, there are larger printers that are available, but they can be really expensive and they're still pretty much prototypes in, in most cases. I mean, some of them print boats, cars. I mean, they're, they're really big. And either that means that it's gonna take weeks to print your part at a high resolution or you're sacrificing resolution um, and so, those are some issues. And then also we, we tend to have more trouble on bigger parts with having a level bottom. So the first layer doesn't actually bond to the plate adequately, and then it'll create some problems down the road. Um, 
uneven heating also causes bigger problems. And so uh, one of the ideas behind this is that we could just weld. And so in the first year, our main thing was just for thermoplastics, we, we basically can just heat the, the plastic, press it, and then cool it, and then it's going to be done. And so there's a couple of ways that we played around with this. We did uh, 3D printing pens. Um, which are just really simple extruders. So this is the, the same as what is on a, a typical 3D printing uh, printer, but instead of an XY table, it's just a handheld device. Um, we also found out that you can stick a, a piece of filament uh, of the thicker variety into a standard Dremel and then run it at 3000 RPM, and it'll actually locally weld the, the substrate so whatever part you have and itself, and then mix it together, which is kind of neat. And then the last one is to, to just simply use a soldering iron to heat up the structures prior to pressing them together and letting them cure or cool together. So uh, we played around with creating some, some tensile test shears. And uh, in the first round, we actually had with no training whatsoever, we had one, one uh, setup that exceeded the, the theoretical max. So we actually had a break outside of the weld zone, which was amazing. And so it was like, okay, maybe this, maybe this has some merit and we should do a little bit more study. And we did a little bit more study and we found a couple of things that worked really well. And so the thing that we came across was that if we took the 3D printing pen, um, ran that into the weld zone, and then afterwards chased it, with a soldering iron with a flat head and uh, and smoothed it out, it, it gave very good properties. Um, so that's what we did. So that was our, our setup for this second test suite, which was this year. Um, and in this case, what we we're looking at was the flexural properties. So specifically, we were looking at what, what weld length do we need? What weld spacing is required? And um, does it matter if it's on top bottom or both for a flexural test. And so we set up this whole thing. Students uh, got together and made 135 specimens uh, and we tested them all. And the results came back with showing us that we could actually successfully create a weld that would be stronger than the original filled 3D print. So this is not a solid, PLA structure. This is a, a open air structure for the most part. And so we do have some leeway to actually make a, a stronger part than that because it's not a solid piece of, of plastic. Um, and so we found though that at a three quarter inch length uh, with a quarter inch spacing, we were able to achieve uh, a stronger joint than the original by having it on the bottom. And so, um, this then allows us to do some analysis of the interactions. You can see that as we go up in uh, the weld spacing, uh, the flexural strength is going to decrease. So as it gets tighter and tighter together, you're going to have a stronger weld. Um, and as that length increases, obviously, we're going to have a, a stronger weld as well. Um, the important part was that it was on the tensile side. So in a flexural test, what that means is that it's going to be on the bottom side, because as I'm pushing on this, I'm actually stretching it on the bottom and I'm compressing it on the top. And so as long as that welds on the bottom, it's going to be stronger. Okay. Um, this was then used to model an arm. <laughs> so we stuck some rubber bands on, on a student and uh, at about a one inch spacing, we did some caliper measurements and one in both of the primary axes and then stuck that into SOLIDWORKS and did some 3D printing and then welded it together. And as you can see here, this is a final form of one of the arms. So you can see that the, the welds there were set up in a way to take advantage of that thing. So where this would be used in the world is if we're looking at this to cut corners on time for prototyping, especially tooling, um, we may spend $10,000 or more on a big printer that could handle one part. Uh, we can also spend $10,000 on like 10 printers. And, uh, and instead of it being a 200 hour print, it could be 20 because each one of those printers could print off a 10th of that part. 
at the same time. So uh, this allows us then to, to basically use the best of all of our worlds to create composites at a, in a time time uh, timely manner. Um, after this, though, what we would do is basically use some sacrificial tooling. And so in this case, uh, we've got a filament winding operation where you're just going to take some fiber and stick it through a resin bath and then wrap it around your part. Uh, we've got vacuum assisted methods where we just take our fabric um, and either impregnate that with resin first or wrap it around here and then wipe in resin onto the tool itself. Um, and then they also have braided sock. So braided sock for a unit like this would be ideal because we could just stretch it right over the mandrel and then infuse that with resin. Um, and that's our intention tomorrow. We're going to be doing that. Um, so we're, we're a day behind on that, unfortunately. Um, so there's a couple of things that need to be done after this. Um, and hopefully if I have another minute or two, I can show you how this actually works. Uh, but we do have an issue with how do we automate this to make it less uh, less labor intensive to cut. So if we had a part that we made and we wanted to print it, there should be some button on the software where it just automatically cuts all of these cuts. Um, so that's going to be one of the big problems. And then whether or not this is actually needed to be as thick as we have it, and then what would it actually take structurally to, to support some type of vacuum? Because those vacuums can be very, very strong. So, all right. With that, I had questions and I got a demo. Would you like to see the demo or? Sure, we've got about three minutes left. So if you want to take advantage of that, go right ahead. Anybody have any questions while I, while I set up for that? Okay, I'm going to jump over to here. I'm going to change that to not blur. Okay, so the way this would work is we have our two parts that we're going to be butting together. And I have this, uh, this printing extruder here. Okay. And so what I would be doing, let's just heat up for a minute. This one has a nice temperature control, which is nice. Let me go about the middle on the feed. And what's going to happen here is we're just going to do a quick spot weld in the corners first, and then we can come back in and chase it afterwards and then clean it up. So it's ready to go now. So all we're going to do is just dwell it into the corner, fill it into the other corner. And this does go better with fixed drain. But I'm just showing you this. You can do it pretty much free-handed now. And then you're just going to drive it in with a weld. So we just did the corners first to kind of freeze it in place as we did the rest of the work. And I also just kind of used that wood sample to mash it down a bit. But you can see that basically this is going to be all you would need to do to get your weld. And then afterwards, if you wanted to, you can come back and chase off any excess. With one of these. Battery nodes. So it's basically all that you'd have to do. And then you're going to have a nice structural well. Um, and so. One of the biggest issues, though, is making sure that you have alignment throughout. Um, and so I think this will be an interesting thing for, for the future, uh, future research as well. But um, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. So 
Um, is there any questions?